and welcome and thank you for joining me. On your request, today we're going to talk about flow best practices. So this is something that I have gathered from my own experience as well as looking at different orgs and working with flows. So this is not set defined flow best practices, but it's more of my version of it. And we're going to divide into five different categories of the flow best practices and you should be able to apply this right away in your org. So let's jump right into it. Number one. Plan, plan, plan before building. This is something I see happening all the time, especially since we are developers and admins, we are so excited to build something. And I get that. And that can be a little bit challenging to kind of take a step back and get to the drawing board, get all the requirements straightened out, draw or use whiteboards. However, your method of visualization is, you can use different tools these days, Miro, Lucy Chart, even online whiteboarding tools. So use those to your advantages and kind of try to have a visual representation of what you're going to build. So it could be a screen flow or a before trigger or after trigger flow. But if you have those kind of elements in mind, you want to get the records, you want to update the records, how are you getting the records? What is the screen element? How should it look like? If you can kind of visualize that, that will make it a lot easier for you to then start building the flow. Otherwise, you will get the requirements in piecemeal and then you'll just end up it, the flow will just end up being a little bit messier and then you'll you'll have a lot of work to clean up and you can just use your notebook as well you don't have to use a tool just a first best practice that you can right away apply to your org next one naming conventions and I've, i talk about this a lot uh, in my other videos as well so there are different types of naming conventions that you can apply whatever you do be consistent so for example, number one naming convention is for the flow itself. And this is where maybe we'll look at an example. So I'm just going to show you in my org what are the different flows I have. And I will show you a bad example of what it should not look like. So let's look at all the flows here. And imagine you get an org and you have like tons of flows and they are just not following any naming convention whatsoever. So this is just my trial or my developer org. So obviously I'm not following any naming convention. You can see here I have after insert and then I'm just saying account region. What does that even mean? So two types of naming conventions that you can apply. Um, if you're creating a screen flow, let's say, let's pick this one. You want to kind of tell in the description what is the flow about, where it is being used and so on so that if you look at it, you'll be able to say, okay, this, this create a case screen flow is being used in this lightning page or in this uh, lightning action. And this is the use case for it. Or maybe if you're using Jira or any tracking tool, you can also give the case number or the ticket number that you got the requirement from. It's really good for auditing purposes as well. So give a nice label as well as a description for screen flow. For the record triggered flow, what you can do, this is just a suggestion. You don't have to follow this, follow whatever works for your org. But what you can do is give the object name and then what is it doing? Is it after insert? Is it before insert? Is it after insert update? So and flow, if you want to add a flow, you can do that. So let's say if you have an after insert flow, you'll say account object name after insert flow or before insert flow or before insert update flow. And then in the description, you can start adding what are the different types or where, where did it come from, the requirement originated from and so forth. So that's one type. Another type is actually in the flow itself, right? So for example, if you're creating a get records element, you'll have to name it. So this is an example of bad naming convention. What I'm saying is look up op record. It's good, it makes sense, but it could be better. You want to make it consistent. Maybe a better way would be actually naming it something like get opportunity records, something like that. You can follow a naming convention, camel casing. So if you're non-programmatic background, camel casing is starts from lowercase and then every word is uppercase. So you can do something like this if it's account, ACC records, right? So you'll have to start building the kind of consistency around all your variables. That's one element. Another type of variables that you'll create is actually record variables. So for example, if I want to create a record variable, I would say variable. 
and where opportunity. So that tells me that this is an opportunity record. Data type will be record. And I will say opportunity, right? So nobody, anybody can come to this flow and can understand that this is an opportunity variable and it's a record type variable. If you are doing a multiple values collection, then what you need to also do is use something like this, var opti list, or maybe call it var opti collection, whatever works for you. You can do it something like this. Description, probably a little bit overkill in this point, but always good to add description as well if you want to. You can say this opportunity collection is being used to do something, whatever that requirement might be. So just little tweaks here and there can help your flow and make your life a lot easier. Even if you come after five years to look at that flow, you will know what exactly it's doing. And another one I see happening a lot is an element type. So if in a screen, so if you are in a screen and if you are dragging and dropping these elements or input elements into your screen, make sure you're naming them correctly. So for example, I have a close date here and I'm saying close date. That's good. Um, then later when I'm trying to create the opportunity and trying to use that element, I will know what exactly that is for. You can even go do it better and maybe name it something like where close date or where opti close date. In that way, you know that this close date needs to tie to the opportunity close date. So when I'm trying to create a record close date and I can just pick that close date because I know that's what close date is. If I named it something totally random, I would have a hard time figuring that out. Now, anybody comes and look at this flow, they will know what exactly that means. Okay. So I think that's enough said about naming conventions. So just be consistent and follow a pattern, maybe document it for any new admins that you might hire. So everybody that's using that org follows the same naming convention and it remains consistent throughout. Okay. Next one. Number three, flow per object and how many flows do you or should you have per objects, especially for record triggered flows, because it doesn't apply to other flows. So this is really specific on your specific use cases and how your org, how your requirements are coming in. Let's say if you had all the requirements at once, you could get away with just four flows per object at maximum. Let me explain that. So Imagine you have all the requirements on, on the account object and you know what needs to happen when. So going back to the first point, you will, you will plan every step on how that flow is supposed to fire. For example, your requirement is whenever an account is created and the rating is hot, you want to create the opportunity related to that account. That's number one requirement. Number two requirement is anytime country is populated on that account, and this is anytime populated on insert or on update. Then I want to populate another field on the same account record. Let's say region field. So now you, as you plan, you will start to kind of identify that the first one where you want to create a related record opportunity that has to be an after insert flow. And for the first requ second requirement, that is when country is populated, you want to populate the reasons. So now you know it needs to be two different flows because when you create a flow, let's say you create a record triggered flow, it will ask you what kind of flow you want to build because it's different than triggers. Triggers, you can have everything defined in the same trigger and then you can call different classes. But in flows that different, that's different. You will have to select whether you want to fire it on created, updated, created, updated, or deleted, and then before and after. So this is where you'll define that. So basically you'll have four times two combinations of flows. So you can have those many flows on your object, that's fine. That doesn't hurt anything as long as you are really aware of what are the conditions. So that's where you start to get into, maybe those flow will start colliding each other. So as long as you have your conditions defined, properly you're saying rating equals hot so it will not fire for anything else it will only fire when rating is hot and it is only firing on insert so in other conditions it will not fire at all so that's perfect and then this one 
I'm saying, okay, if the record is created or updated after the record is saved, do that. And that's fine too, because now we are already defining the condition. You can go further and say every time a record is updated and meets the condition requirements or only when the record is updated. So that's another situation you might want to use and to make sure that the flow doesn't run more than it's needed. Now you might have requirements where those both requirements are after the flow is after the record is created but they both have different conditions and they're not related at all in this situation let's say if the requirement was if the rating is hot i want to create an opportunity in prospecting stage or negotiation stage if the rating is warm i want to create an opportunity in prospecting stage so because we are referring to same rating field you'll be able to just say rating not equals null a rating null is false basically we're saying it's not null and then you can just add a decision where you'll add multiple outcomes and this is where you'll also follow naming conventions rating equals cold or warm in our case and here you'll say rating is warm it's warm and so now you have two decisions if it is hot it will go to one branch if it is warm it will go to the other branch so basically you are your first condition is rating is not null and then you're further defining the condition and the decision element only will work one or the other it will not go to all the different branches so whichever branch meets the condition it will only go there so it depends on what kind of requirements you're getting and let's say if you have a requirement which is completely different than rating doesn't have to do anything with rating maybe that's for your address maybe the requirement is if the address is populated then create a contact just a random requirement in that case you can create a NIF different flow same account insert after but this time your condition will be address is not null and so only that condition will apply for that flow and that will fire and you can see all that inside a debug so I do have an example for the debug let me bring that up here so you can actually start to look at the debug logs which will tell you how the flow fired which one fired first and so on so account insert after fire first if I insert an account then once the account is fired then opportunity gets created then the, all the opportunity flow will fire because I have an opportunity flow before insert that will fire right here opportunity insert before and all the opportunity things will fire then once that's all completed then uh, it will come back to account where I have the another flow that I showed you where it's updating the region so that flow will fire so it depends on what requirements you're getting which is so much important to plan and communicate so that's the, that brings me to the next point where you want to use all the criteria before using automations you also want to check what other automations are present present in your org because if you're just going and building a flow for an account or an opportunity whichever object and there's already triggers present there's process builders workflow rules and some other automations you want to make sure what else is there so that you can customize your flow accordingly or maybe you can use whatever is existing and add the conditions there instead of creating a new flow so communication is very important here so that you don't end up in a situation where you run into issues and errors because they are kind of fighting each other those flows and be aware of the order of operation so salesforce has this really good guide on order of operation i highly recommend this for anyone not just for flow because it will tell you that all the record triggered flows which are configured to run before the record is saved is fired first then the triggers are fired then the workflow rules and everything else process builders and then after insert triggers so definitely read this because this gives you an idea of what you can expect when you run into the situations of multiple automations per object number four using dmls dml is database manipulation inside a loop so 
and I have a full detailed video on this one. Definitely check that out if you're new to this. But basically, whenever you are using a loop, loop is usually used when you're doing a collection. So let's say you have a collection of contact, maybe on the update of an account address, you want to update all the contact addresses as an example. So basically, you'll have an account after update flow, and then you'll query all the contacts, put them in a collection, then you will use a loop. So you use the loop to go through that all the collection and maybe you are doing some tweaks for each record and then you want to update them all at once. You don't want to ever put an insert element or an update element inside the loop because loop definition, by definition, what it does is it will take, let's say if you have 100 contacts in that collection, it will take one contact, make the changes and insert it. It will take another contact, make the changes and update it, depending on what your element is, and then so on. So right there, you now have 100 updates at once happening in your org, which is really bad because then you'll run into DML issues because those all count as one transaction. So you want to make sure that you are taking those changes, putting them in an assignment. So that's why I have highlighted assignment element because you can use assignment to assign those values collect them in a different collection, then insert or update in one go rather than doing one at a time. And just be conscious of every time you make an insert or update element interact with the database, it is doing something in the background. It's not unlimited resource, it is limited. So you want to be conscious when you're building these from the get-go. Okay, and this is the last one, exception handling. So exception handling is so important because a lot of times we're trying to insert a record and maybe there's a validation rule on that account or maybe the person doesn't have access to that some field so there are errors that bound to be happened right so you want to make sure that you are using a fault path and i have a video on this on how to set that up so there are different ways to handle the exception so make sure you are either sending an email to the admin or somebody who can look at that error and figure out what happened this is not this is different from the automated email that you'll get. You can actually make it more customizable for you. You can see who started it, uh, what was the node that failed and so on. So be careful of that using exception handling. You can also show a very good message to the end user so that they don't see that generic unhandled exception occurred. Instead, they will see something a little bit more better that they can understand. And debugging techniques, I added it because um, you, as an admin or a developer, you want to be able to debug where it went wrong. So your options are you can go through that email. And now with uh, Summer 21, there are different features how you can debug flow error de logs inside your setup to look at all the errors that happened. You can also look at the debug logs that like I showed you. The debug logs are really nice, which will give you detailed of what happened so you can set the debug log for the user and then test it out that way so there are different ways to debug a flow so learn that techniques try to read that log it even though it looks really um, like a different language if you actually pay attention to it it is telling you what it, what actually it is and this is where that's why it's so important to have your naming conventions right because if you are naming, naming them properly, it will be so much easier to debug it because you know which account, or which object, which field it is firing on. So you can debug it properly. And that is all of the best practices that I had. I will share, Salesforce has some other uh, best practices as well. Basically being aware of all the flow errors and flow limits, essentially. Um, so I'll share that link as well. And I'll share the link to all these help guides that I have here from Salesforce. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this was helpful. Let me know if I missed anything or something that you want to add so other people can look at that as well. Thank you so much.